Having looked at the many examples of how history and archaeological findings have backed up the Old Testament, it's now time to move on to the New Testament. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. These famous words of Luke chapter 2 verses 1 through 3 have inspired much controversy among skeptics, and for a long time were believed by many to contradict actual records. One point of controversy has been over whether such censuses were ever taken in those times. Wheaton College professor of New Testament and Archaeology, John McRae, responds to this in an interview with Lee Strobel, report recorded in the book The Case for Christ. He explains that official orders have been discovered from a time not long after Christ lived, which describes censuses requiring citizens to return to their own homes in order to be counted. Now this doesn't refer to the exact census mentioned in the Bible, but it does establish that what Luke describes had indeed been known to happen around that time. Additionally, Luke's mention of Quirinius had long been thought to be wrong because preeminent ancient historian Josephus records a census by Quirinius happening several years after the time of Jesus' birth. In a report published by the Interdisciplinary Biblical Research Institute, Ronald Marchant makes a number of interesting contextual observations in response to this supposed discrepancy. He takes a closer look at the political career of Quirinius and finds that he was in command of the Roman army in Cilicia, not Syria, until about 6 BC. However, according to findings by archaeologist Sir William Ramsey, the only Roman legion in all of Asia belonged to Syria. In light of this, and the fact that Quirinius conquered territory contiguous to Syria, it becomes reasonable to assume that he may have had authority over a region, including part of Syria, as early as 6 BC. Additionally, the governors at that time may not have been as specifically defined as we would think, and records of Josephus refer to examples of multiple people being officers or governors of a particular region at once. Thus, records that show someone besides Quirinius having authority in Syria when Christ was born does not necessarily mean that Quirinius was not also in a governing position prior to 6 AD, which is when Josephus mentions him being in office. Finally, Luke's mention of this being the first census seems to imply that more than one took place while Quirinius was in power, which could easily mean that the one Josephus mentions was in fact a later census. There's more to this issue, and Marchant goes into much greater depth in his article, but I think this much makes it pretty clear that Luke's account has by no means been proven false. Continuing his interview with John McRae, Lee Strobel reports that contrary to the claims of skeptics, and despite little to no mention of its existence in prominent historical accounts, we do in fact know that the town of Nazareth probably did exist during Jesus' time. The first piece of evidence that he cites is an archaeological finding that mentions a priest's family being relocated to Nazareth in 70 AD. True, this is after Christ died, but close enough that it's likely that Nazareth had already been around for a while. Other digs have uncovered objects from tombs in the outskirts of the town from the first century. In the conclusion to this section, Strobel writes the following, quote, Even the usually skeptical Ian Wilson, citing pre-Christian remains found in 1955 under the Church of the Annunciation in present-day Nazareth, has managed to concede. Such findings suggest that Nazareth may have existed in Jesus' time, but there's no doubt that it must have been a very small and insignificant place so insignificant that Nathaniel's musings in John 1, 46 now make more sense. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Professor of Ancient History at Western Michigan University, Dr. Paul Meyer, is a knowledgeable advocate for the historical and archaeological veracity of the New Testament. In the October 1999 edition of The Lutheran Witness, he wrote the following about the importance of names in the Holy Land. Quote, Topography also provides interesting traces of the supernatural dimension in Jesus' ministry. Bethany, where he raised Lazarus from the dead, according to John 11, is still called Batania by Israelis. But to the majority Arab population of that Jerusalem suburb, the name of the town is El Lazaraye, or the place of Lazarus. That name change was known as far back as the time of 3rd and 4th century church historian Eusebius, 
and exactly what one would expect if indeed Bethany had witnessed so great a miracle as the dead being raised. A similar instance is the southwestern suburb of Damascus. To this day, that location at the edge of the Syrian capital is named Daraya, or the vision in Arabic, because of what happened to Saul, the future Saint Paul, on the Damascus road. And this is despite the fact that the overwhelming majority Islamic Arabs of Damascus are hardly defenders of the Christian faith. Again, these topographical examples do not themselves prove the miraculous events of these places, but they surely are instances of fallout from something extraordinary that must have occurred. It is also significant to observe that historians of the day mention the events of the Bible in their own writings. Obviously, their focus was elsewhere, so these are often made in passing, but they provide valuable extra-biblical evidence of the activity of the early church. First century Roman historian Tacitus writes the following about Nero's persecution of the Christians in his annals. Quote, Christus suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilatus, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. Obviously it's not news that Christianity eventually spread to Rome, but Tacitus' record of Christ's crucifixion and a subsequent superstition, most likely the resurrection, makes it clear that the news of this had spread quickly and won converts willing to be tortured for their faith. Jewish historian Josephus also corroborates biblical testimony in a number of ways. In the Antiquities of the Jews, he records the martyrdom of Jesus' brother James. Quote, High priest Ananias assembled the Sanhedrin of Judges, and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others, or some of his companions. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. Josephus also attests the preaching and martyrdom of John the Baptist. Quote, now some of the Jews thought that the destruction of Herod's army came from God, and that very justly, as a punishment of what he did against John, that was called the Baptist. For Herod slew him, who was a good man, and commanded the Jews to exercise virtue, both as to righteousness toward one another, and piety towards God, and so to come to baptism. Another writing by Josephus is widely regarded to have been edited by biased copyists. The most widespread version of this passage contains several matter-of-fact statements regarding Jesus' miraculous resurrection and him being the prophesied Christ. Since Josephus was almost certainly not a Christian, it appears highly unlikely that he would say such things. Thus, scholars have analyzed the passage and determined that portions of it appear to be in keeping with Josephus' style of writing, and others seem to be obvious additions. A reference to a 4th century Arabic version of this passage has been found, which lacks these apparent additions and thus appears to be the original untainted version. Even in this form, it is a significant testimony to Christ's ministry. Quote, At this time there was a wise man who was called Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. Many people from among the Jews and other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die and those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion, and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom the prophets have recounted wonders." In the book I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, Norman Giesler and Frank Turek summarize the corroboration of Christ by ancient historians as follows. Quote, there are ten known non-Christian writers who mention Jesus within 150 years of his life. By contrast, over the same 150 years, there are nine non-Christian sources who mention Tiberius Caesar, the Roman emperor at the time of Jesus. Piecing together all ten non-Christian references, we see that Jesus lived during the time of Tiberius Caesar, he lived a virtuous life, he was a wonder worker, he had a brother named James, he was acclaimed to be the Messiah, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified on the eve of the Jewish Passover. Darkness and an earthquake occurred when he died. His disciples believed he rose from the dead. His disciples were willing to die for their belief. Christianity spread rapidly as far as Rome. And his disciples denied the Roman gods and worshipped Jesus as God. Clearly, Jesus' life was not something fabricated by a bunch of people trying to start a new religion.
While these references do not establish his divinity, they do provide powerful evidence in the Bible's favor. The New Testament's consistency with historical and archaeological discoveries shows that its writers were certainly familiar with the places and events surrounding Christ's life. But beyond this, there are many other reasons to believe that the books of the Bible were not significantly embellished versions of what actually happened either. First off, the New Testament books were almost certainly all written in the first century AD, within the lifetimes of those who had been eyewitnesses of Christ's life. This is important for a number of reasons. Obviously, the earlier the Gospels were written, the more likely the writers accurately remembered the events that they were recording. But we must also remember that there were plenty of other people who had witnessed Christ's ministry and death. Many of these people would still have been alive when the Gospels would have begun to be distributed. If Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John had stretched the truth, the many Jews who had also been there would have spoken up against them and prevented the Gospels from gaining widespread acceptance in those early years. In Is the New Testament Reliable? Paul Barnett explains how we know that all the New Testament books were written by around 100 AD. It turns out that 25 of the 27 books were all referenced by Clement, Ignatius, and Polycarp in the years from 95 to 110 AD. The other two books, Jude and 2 John, were almost certainly written before this time as well. Jude was Jesus' half-brother and would most likely have died by 100 AD, and 2 John was written before 3 John, which was one of the 25 cited books. But can we go further back? After all, 100 AD is still about 70 years after Christ's death. Giesler and Turek point out several reasons that many of the books were probably written much earlier. In 70 AD, Jerusalem was laid siege and conquered by the Romans, and the temple was destroyed. Jesus predicted this event in Mark 13 too, and yet none of the New Testament writers mention the events. This makes it clear that Jerusalem had not yet fallen, and thus the books had been written prior to this time, about 40 years after Christ's death. Giesler and Turek also explain how we can know that Acts was written before 62 AD, and Luke before that. Luke, a doctor, is known for the remarkable detail with which he recorded events. Nowhere in Acts does he mention the death of Paul, with whom he was traveling. Yet we know from Clement that Paul was killed before 68, and from Josephus that their close friend James was killed in 62. The fact that Luke makes no mention of either event means he must have finished the book before then, about 30 years after Christ's death. Giesler and Turek cite numerous reasons and quote several experts on the subject, including anti-Christian atheist John Robinson, for even earlier dates for some books, with the general conclusion placing the dates of all New Testament books between about 40 and 75 AD. At this point, it is clear that the books were written well within the lifetimes of people who had witnessed Christ's ministry. As for why the writers didn't write the Gospels even sooner rather than waiting years after Christ had died, Giesler and Turek explain how the illiteracy of people in that society would have meant that writing it down would not have been of the highest priority. And also, oral records were generally quite accurate back then, since that's the way people were used to communicating information. To wrap up this topic, I'd like to again turn to Giesler and Turek's I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist and summarize the top 10 reasons that they give for believing that the New Testament writers told the truth. Number 1. The New Testament writers included embarrassing details about themselves. Anyone familiar with the Gospels can attest to the many times the disciples are portrayed as unable to grasp what Christ was telling them, too weak to stay awake when he asked them to keep watch, and doubtful when they first heard that Christ had risen. This is a good reason to believe that the writers are being truthful, otherwise they probably would have left out such unflattering descriptions of themselves. Number 2. They include embarrassing details and difficult sayings of Jesus. Mark 3, 20 through 21 says that Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. In John 8, Jesus speaks critically of those who had believed his teachings, telling them, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. Elsewhere, various people call him a drunkard, demon-possessed, and a madman. He associates with a prostitute and others that the religious leaders of the day referred to as sinners.
If the New Testament writers were trying to embellish Christ's greatness, it's doubtful that they would have included details such as these. Number three. Similarly, Giesler and Turek point out that Jesus is quoted as saying some pretty tough and even borderline offensive things which many Christians still struggle with. Surely they would have preferred to leave these out if they were more concerned with making Jesus popular. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us that looking lustfully at a woman is the same thing as committing adultery with her, and that we are to turn the other cheek when wronged, and to love our enemies, etc. In John 6, Christ's disciples react with shock when he says, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. Now we understand from the context of Christ's other teachings and his words at the Last Supper that this was a reference to the spiritual significance of the sacrament of communion. But given the fact that these sentences still sound a lot like cannibalism, a misinterpretation that helped fuel the Romans' persecutions of Christians, it is doubtful that the writers would have voluntarily explained it this way. Number four, the writers carefully distinguish Jesus' words from their own. This is relevant because it shows that they weren't paraphrasing or modifying Jesus' words according to their motives. For example, Paul doesn't put words in Jesus' mouth in order to specifically speak against various controversies, but instead clearly differentiates his own words from Jesus'. Number five, Turek and Giesler mentioned several details about the resurrection that the writers had no reason to invent. The Gospel's positive mention of Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Jewish ruling council that had sentenced Jesus to die, is not something that they would have made up. He was on the side of their enemies. Also, if Jesus wasn't really buried there, the council would have had no trouble proving the claim wrong. The first witnesses of the resurrection were women, one of them being formerly demon-possessed definitely not the most trustworthy sources by the cultural standards of the day. The mention of Jewish priests converting to Christianity would not have been a wise inclusion if it were false, because it too would have been easy for the anti-Christian Pharisees to expose as a lie. Finally, Matthew claims in chapter 28 of his Gospel that the Jewish cover-up of the resurrection was common knowledge among Jews. This is another example of something that would have been easy to expose as false since his very readers would know from experience whether it was correct. Number six, the writers of the New Testament describe over 30 historically verified people, many of them well known and powerful such as Pilate, Caiaphas, Festus, and Felix, as being directly related to biblical events. Connections that these persons, or those near them, would have quickly denied had they been false. Seven, the Gospels contain divergent details. It isn't intuitively obvious that the Gospels containing different information would be a testament to their accuracy, but in fact it can be. If the Gospel accounts contradicted each other by blatantly giving contrary details about the same event, then clearly this would be a sign of error somewhere. Instead, when the Gospels differ, it is in the details they decide to include. There's no reason to believe that they aren't describing the same event, they just highlighted different parts. This fact is evidence that the writers didn't get together and fabricate a particular storyline. If they had, their stories would sound basically the same and not describe the same event in such different ways. Modern day reporting is the same way. Different journalists or witnesses often point out different details of the same event. For a quick example, consider the various Gospels description of the angels at the empty tomb. Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20 all describe the same scene a bit differently. Matthew and Mark mention an angel and a young man dressed in a white robe, while Luke and John specifically speak of two angels. If Matthew and Mark had said that there was only one angel, this would be a contradiction, but instead they seem to only mention the angel who actually talks, while Luke and John point out the further detail that there were two angels present. Different levels of detail, but not a contradiction. John also tells the story a bit differently than the other writers. Matthew, Mark, and Luke jump from the women visiting the tomb to them speaking to the angel, whereas John says that they visited the tomb, saw that it was empty, then told the disciples who checked it out and then went home, then came back and heard the angel speak. It is interesting that John's Gospel mentions so much happening between the first visit and the angels appearing, while the others describe the two as happening right after one another. But again, the difference is in the details, and while the stories do differ on certain points, such as intermediate events and the actual words of the angels, 
They are all in agreement about what is essential. The women visited the tomb early in the morning on the first day of the week, found it empty. Later they went inside to investigate and were approached by at least one angel who spoke to them about Christ having risen, and then they left. Jesus then appeared to the women, and after they recognized him, they hurried to tell the disciples. Despite their differences, all four Gospels tell this exact story. As mentioned earlier, the differences provide all the more reason to believe that the writers were not all referring to the same script, but were telling it as they, or their primary source, actually remembered the event. The eighth reason Gisler and Turek give is the fact that the New Testament writers challenge their readers to verify the facts, even concerning miracles. For example, in his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul reminds them that he had performed signs, wonders, and miracles among them, something he obviously wouldn't have pointed out if they hadn't in fact witnessed these works. 9. The New Testament writers describe miracles not with grand supernatural language, but in a simple, matter-of-fact manner like they describe all the other events. Christ's resurrection isn't a flashy event in the Gospels, but rather was revealed through a couple angels in a tomb to some women who then ran into Jesus posing as a gardener. Yes, there's a brief mention of an earthquake and a rock rolling over, but if the Gospel writers had been making the story up, you'd think they'd have made it out to be a bit more spectacular. Instead, we just read about a few low-key conversations in tombs and gardens. This same objective tone is present in all the Gospels' descriptions of miracles, from the water turning into wine to the raising of Lazarus. It's all explained in a very factual way, without a bunch of punchy adjectives. The final reason Giesler and Turek give to trust the New Testament writers, and this is especially significant, is the fact that they abandoned their culture and heritage and willingly died for what they preached. It's one thing for religious people to die for something they've been taught to believe is true, but who dies for something they know to be false? The details in the Gospel accounts, along with extra-biblical corroboration for the life of Christ, make it clear that the disciples who either wrote or were the primary source for Gospel did indeed know and travel with Christ. These disciples claimed to have witnessed with their own eyes that Christ came back to life. Now either they did or they didn't, we can't prove which. However, if they didn't, why on earth would they be willing to dedicate their entire life and to be martyred for something that they knew to be a lie? What could they possibly hope to gain? The disciples' rapid transformation from hopeless after Christ's execution to tireless missionaries after his supposed resurrection should be evidence enough that they were absolutely convinced that Christ had risen. Their willingness to die for this is the ultimate testimony. Christ was the Messiah, and they knew it. And with that, we bring this series to a close. I'm convinced, and I sincerely hope that these videos have helped convince you, that Christianity is not just some religion devised by men. Nature, science, logic, history, archaeology, and literary critiques all support the same conclusion. It just makes sense to trust the Bible.